Okay, great. I've, I I got the recording and progress note, so we're we're all good. Let me get let me get this situated. All right, okay. I think um I think we can begin. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and um, this is the second in the series of our webinar. Um, I will just begin by introducing AWIS. Um, this was founded 60 years ago to further knowledge of India and the United States by supporting American scholarship in India. Uh, the program of AWIS fosters the production and engagement um, of scholarship and engagement in India, and it promotes and ad advances mutual understanding between citizens of United States and India. AWIS seeks to provide access to scholarship about India to a wide and diverse audience. So um, welcome to the November 2022 uh, episode of the AWIS. Um, this is a special on their 60th anniversary webinar series. It's called Sharing Homes, US-India Collaborative Scholarship. Um, I'm Richa uh, Wupaluri. I'm a fellow with the AWIS for um, the semester. And um, this year we've been celebrating the history of scholarship in and through AWIS, exploring the narratives within the walls of the Institute and the conversations that have happened thanks to the support of AWIS. Um, today, we turn to the second webinar in our series highlighting collaboration and co-creation. Um, it's a foundational piece of what makes AWIS the American Institute of Indian Studies. Um, and now I'm thrilled to turn over things to our president of AWIS, Sumithi Ramaswamy, to introduce our guests. Sumithi, on to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richa, and welcome to everyone who has joined us from various parts of the world. In particular, I'm enormously grateful to our two guests, who I will introduce shortly, Professor Aloko, who is joining us from the U.S., and Professor Ponaya from India, for taking the time to participate in this special event. I also want to thank everyone at the AWIS who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this event possible. Elise Auerbach, our executive director in Chicago. Purnima Mehta, our director general in New Delhi, who you will hear from at the end of this event. And Richard Vupaluri, who we have just heard from, from the University of Virginia, who's interning this semester at the Institute and so helpfully coordinating many of the events connected to our 60th anniversary. And not least, a huge thanks to Anandi Silvanupel, who is our special projects coordinator. Hey, do you want to go outside and ride your bike? Do you want to go to the park in town and ride your bike? <laughs> Oh, and not <laughs> we heard from Anandi sort of, you know, indirectly, but there she is. She's going to join us in a few seconds, and she is going to be leading the discussion with our two speakers, and it is who it is now my honor to formally introduce. Amy L. Alico is Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Multi-Faith Scholars Program at Elon University in North Carolina. She's an ethnographer whose research focuses on vernacular Hinduism, especially contemporary Hindu ritual and religious practices in Tamil Nadu, where she has been studying and conducting fieldwork for more than 20 years. Professor Alako has written about snake goddess worship, Hindu religious healing traditions, and feminist ethnography, and is the co-editor co of Ritual Innovation, Strategic Interventions in South Asian Religion, published in 2018. She's currently working on a book project with the great title, Living with the Dead in Hindu South India, which focuses on ceremonies to honor deceased relatives. James Ponaya is the Assistant Professor and Head of Department of Christian Studies at the University of Madras in Chennai. He was formerly the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy at Jnanadipa Vidya Peet Pontifical Institute of Philosophy and Religion in Pune. He was as well a visiting scholar at the University of California in Berkeley for the academic year 2008-2009. He was a co-investigator for a project titled Christianity, Religious Freedom, and Religious Violence in Contemporary India, which was funded by the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. His recent publications include Psycho-Spiritual Mentoring of Adolescents, which was published in 2019, and Culture, Religion, and Homemaking in and Beyond South Asia, 
published in 2020, on from which I'm, I'm presuming we will hear quite a bit today. Thank you again, Professors Aliko and Punaya. And over to you, Anandi. I hope you're all set to take over from here. Welcome. Thank you all. Sorry so much for that. Um, this week was a time change where I am from everyone else, and then it only lasts seven days. So I'm a little bit uh, in between times, it seems. So apologies uh, that I'm a little bit late. Um, well, thank you so much, Simothy, for a wonderful introduction. And I'm really thrilled um, to uh, to be moderating this discussion, I'm really curious to hear uh, from some some colleagues I haven't heard from in a little while um, as well about the work and specifically this this idea of home in relation to collaboration, which is the whole theme of these two webinars and in fact the greater 60th anniversary um, kind of celebrations that we're having this year for AAAS. So to start things off, um, Amy and James, this question these questions are for both, of course. Um, can you tell us about, um, can you both tell us a little bit about your collaborative and co-creative work and how it intersects with AAAS, just to give us some, some grounding and context? Yeah, maybe I can start off. Um, so thanks, Anandi, for the question. Um, thanks also to Sumathi for the introduction and the welcome, and also always many thanks to Elise and to Purnima um, and to Risha for organizing us. Um, so James and I knew one another for a number of years through some collaborations um, with the Society of Hindu Christian Studies. And we work in similar and overlapping areas and we already had a friendship um, and a mutual respect, I think, of one another's work. And we participated in a panel together um, in the sort of early 2010s and then decided to co-edit a special issue of the journal Nidan together with the theme of Kali Yuga. So we'd done a longer term collaborative publication and um, project together. And then just on the heels of that coming out, I think in 2014, I was a fellow with AAAS um, doing a research project that is leading to this book, uh, Living with the Dead, that Sumathi mentioned in Chennai in 2015-16. And so although I was not affiliated with the University of Madras, James and I worked together really closely and had a number of opportunities to conduct joint fieldwork, to discuss our separate but ongoing fieldwork projects, um, to think through a lot of the categories of contemporary contemporary Tamil religion um, from a number of different angles. Uh, I can think about particular festivals we attended together and our different perspectives on them. So just almost a year of generative conversation and intersection um, facilitated by my being in Chennai long term with the American Institute of Indian Studies as fellowship that year. I started lecturing pretty regularly at the University of Madras um, during that time, and we conceived of uh, a joint conference, and James can talk about that conference and the resulting publication perhaps in a minute. So during that year, um, a really special resource that we have at Elon University called the Center for the Study of Religion, Culture, and Society, which is directed by Dr. Brian Pennington, formalized a memorandum of understanding between the um, Department of Christian Studies and the University of Madras and Elon University. And so that formalized memorandum of understanding set into motion um, a new set of collaborations that have yielded a number of our research scholars having affiliations and very generous research support um, during their Fulbrights and other research periods while they were in Chennai. So these are Elon students who were conducting research in Chennai. Several of our language students have also received generous support during their time in um, Madras. We have had a number of other publication and conference and committee collaborations that have grown out of that period and that memorandum of understanding. And then importantly, every other January, um, we bring a study abroad course to South India, to Tamil Nadu and to Kerala. Um, and that is co-taught by Dr. Pennington and I, and it involves usually 20 Elon students. And those students too visit the University of Madras, Dr. Panam lectures to them, um, and the University of Madras provides important logistical and intellectual support for that course. So there 
have been a number of exchanges and collaborations really grounded in this period of support um, from my fellowship that enabled me to be in Chennai during that year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amy. I think um, I think you have beautifully summarized the you know, number of collaborations that we have had. Um, I mean, looking at the trajectory of uh, you know, uh, kind of a relationship that built up over a period of time, uh, it started off with a uh, one-on-one -on -one friendship, then went on to official collaboration uh, uh, through AI panel in the year 2010 on uh, Kali Yuga, which I think uh, Miami uh, uh, put together with the help of uh, group scholars, and I was part of it. And it went on to various collaborations, you know, uh, I'm so happy at the end of the day that uh, we have uh, come to know each other and we build up our friendship uh, and we have common uh, you know, research interests, especially on vernacular uh, Indian religions, uh, especially in Hinduism. Uh, we also now are planning to do something in I mean, uh, vernacular Christianity, which we'll talk about a bit later. So I think that's been a very, very dynamic, engaging and um, fascinating uh, collaboration. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for that great introduction um, to the to the nature of the work. Um, so now I'd like to kind of explore some different facets of this kind of collaboration. And first, as we do as scholars to kind of what, what, are, what are our words and definitions, I'd love for you to share your thoughts more about what collaboration means. So between you both as scholars, but also you mentioned, you know, this memorandum of understanding, this MOU kind of formalizing things and putting things into motion. So so collaboration is, is connecting scholarship, institutions, resources, and students. Yeah, I thought uh, maybe I could uh, start off and uh, Amy can fill the gap, uh, you know, or uh, you know, add things I have missed out. Uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, the collaboration, I think, is of, uh, you know, at three, four levels. Maybe I'll start off with one. First, um, the collaboration between scholars, you know, faculty to faculty. Uh, I think there, uh, Dr. Emilia Lako and Dr. Brian and myself, uh, we have done a number of things together, you know. Uh, in the first place, uh, we have uh, uh, did some, uh, you know, uh, joint panels at the AAR. Uh, then we have done some conferences in Chennai. Uh, so this is uh, basically academic collaboration at that level. Uh, but uh, that didn't stop there. It went on to become joint publications. You know, we did uh, you know, a number of things together. The Nidan Journal that uh, Dr. Alako mentioned uh, earlier, uh, that we co-edited together in the year 2014. Uh, then recently, we have, been, uh, we have uh, published this book, which you mentioned earlier. You know, uh, religion, culture, and uh, uh, homemaking in India and South Asia. Um, there, uh, Dr. Melako uh, and Brian uh, did the forward. I edited the book, and it was a fruit of the conference that we held together. So that's at that level. Uh, then um, we also have uh, some kind of uh, uh, faculty to student relationship, you know? uh, especially when uh, uh, Dr. Melako brings students to India once in two years. Uh, I am there with them to talk about Indian Christianity, the caste system in Indian Christianity, the social world of Indian Christians. And um, I, I mean, I accompany them to different churches, temples, mosques in Chennai and Dargas. Um, and we also get them to talk to our students, a so student to student uh, relationship uh, builds up gradually. Uh, so that's the second level. Uh, the third level is again more academic kind of a contribution from uh, from our expertise to the institutions. You know? For instance, when Professor Alako and Brian had been to uh, Chennai, uh, at least I could count at least three talks there. They gave on various topics on uh, vernacular Hinduism, uh, popular religious practices, or um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, the, the British, uh, the, the, the role of Christianity in India, and the critical study of Christianity in India, all that was contributed to uh, by, by uh, you know, the scholars uh, from Elon to Madras University. Uh, conversely, when I was there in the US, I had visited uh, you know, uh, uh, Elon University. I also had uh, uh, you know, given a couple of talks to the students, especially when they were about to take undertake a, a st uh, visit to uh, Sri Lanka. I gave a lecture on um, uh, the, um, the social world of Sri Lankan Tamils, you know, which I was quite familiar with. 
So like that, uh, you know, we also have internet at that level. Um, yeah, uh, of course, uh, uh, besides that, uh, in the students were here in Chennai, along with my students, we have also taken, uh, you know, a student to student kind of interaction. We have uh, been to uh, different places uh, together, visiting, uh, you know, the various sites in Chennai, various sites in Chennai. Uh, these are the level of uh, institutional uh, you know, collaborations. But um, we also have created networks. You know, uh, you know when, uh, when Dr. Emil Laka was here uh, on the fellowship, uh, we did establish collaborations with the Stella Medis College, probably which uh, uh, Professor Alaka will talk more about it. And we have also put together some other joint projects uh, which we have pursued, uh, which is yet to be, uh, you know, yet to receive some grant uh, in collaboration with other institutions. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, collaborations at different levels, which I thought is very, very interesting and fascinating, uh, which has just started off. I'm sure we will uh, hit new milestones in the future. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks. James has touched on a number of different elements of the collaboration. Um, and I think what he's brought to the fore is that we've aimed to make this reciprocal. So for me to answer your question about definitions, Anandi, um, I think of collaboration as exchange um, that flows in both directions. And that's certainly been the case here. And that exchange was so lively and so enriching and so dynamic between Dr. Panaya and I that we thought in 2016, as my fellowship period was coming to a close, that we'd like to bring other people into this really generative collaboration. And so that conference, we were really proud to have scholars from the US and India and Canada and Sri Lanka and probably a couple of other nations participate in what was a really generative um, and lively few days of sessions and panels that resulted in this, this edited volume that um, James just showed us, right? And so we've been able to bring um, students into this collaboration now, and not just Elon students who have the benefit of the very fortunate um, opportunity to learn from Dr. Ponaya and other colleagues in India, but also um, University of Madras students who I have had the chance to mentor, particularly in fieldwork methods um, during my stays in Chennai. So going and giving an academic lecture in the university is a great pleasure and the kinds of questions that you're asked and the kinds of conversations that you're drawn into are often very different than the ones from maybe my home context here in North America. And so that's a great pleasure and it's enriching and it shapes my work. And that to me is the heart of collaboration, right? that there's some palpable change on both ends of the collaborators' um, relationship in terms of their work. But it's also really quite a pleasure to take the mentoring that I'm really invested in doing at my own home institution um, and to have the opportunity to do that one-on-one, -on -one, mostly with graduate students from the University of Madras. And Dr. Pranaya has set up some of those relationships which continue to be alive for me. Um, so one of those graduate students with whom I worked a few years ago to whom Dr. Panaya introduced me, um, has just gotten married and moved to Minnesota. Um, and I've been exchanging messages with her the last few weeks. Um, she's really interested in thinking about what are the academic possibilities for her in the United States. And so I've been talking with her about some of those pathways. So these are live relationships. They're not relationships that are just bounded by the period of the fellowship, um, but they're relationships that continue. And that reciprocity, I think, is a value that we both share. Um, Dr. Panaya also mentioned bringing other institutions into the collaboration, and that has been a really rich piece of it. So Stella Mary's is a venerable and fantastic institution in Chennai, um, and he's introduced me to a number of professors there, and those relationships continue. A few years ago, um, he and I and Dr. Pennington um, submitted a grant application that was not successful that involved colleagues from Stella Mary's and another institution, um, Christ College um, in Tamil Nadu. So we hope that we will be able to it, possibly revise that one or develop another grant application moving into the future. So we're all still thinking about opportunities to bring in other colleagues um, and think about extending those collaborations in interesting ways. There are so many pieces of that that um, to follow up on, and and I love how uh, the idea of collaboration is is something that is continuously 
um, just transforming as uh, the scholarship evolves and matures as um, as students come in and bring their own ideas, perhaps, and then you're opening up and, and bringing in new voices into the collaboration. So it seems like it's kind of transforming and growing in, in interesting organic ways, even kind of outside of what's outlined in the fellowship, perhaps. Um, you mentioned also the, of course, the, the conference in 2016, which, although there were other ways, maybe the collaboration was formalized, maybe because, you know, MOUs and such, um, and, and even in the fellowship grant applications, this was more kind of a, a public maybe formalizing um, of, of these collaborations. Um, you mentioned kind of students coming into the mix, and maybe there was some of this was planned, um, you know, things that you wanted to come out of the conference, but were there any things uh, that were organic that kind of came out unexpected outcomes of this conference of actually bringing people together in that one kind of moment? Yeah, so I, I can contribute one thing which might seem um, perhaps trivial, but it's actually led to really interesting other outcomes, um, some of which we have planned for next academic year. Um, so there's a graduate student who was working with Dr. Ponaya, um, an adult learner who'd come back into the university. Um, and through that conference and through a range of other opportunities to connect with her, um, I wound up hiring someone to cook for me who she recommended, who was a family friend of hers. Um, and, you know, having that woman in my house, in my little flat every day, um, and having the opportunity to get to know her and get to know her kids and her family over time um, was a really enriching part of my fellowship period. Um, and that person continues to be a dear friend. And I hope that in my next um, fellowship stay, she'll again come back and work with me. But she's an everyday expert, as we call them in our study abroad course. So she's a monolingual person who comes in and lectures to our students about her life. Um, she invites students into her very small home and either cooks dosa for them or ties flowers with them or does some activity with them that doesn't require a lot of linguistic um, common ground. We're of course able to translate for her back and forth with students, but they find their way without that linguistic common ground. Um, so this has opened up a set of relationships that become learning relationships, not not just for me, because I certainly learned a lot by working alongside her and getting to know her and being part of her life and also accompanying her family to rituals um, and learning about the really interesting mix of um, Hinduism and Pentecostal Christianity practiced within her family, um, etc. But we also now are thinking, Dr. Ponaya and I, that during my next hopeful fellowship period in India in the next academic year, that we will do a study of that family. Um, there is some really interesting material in their life stories, um, multi-generational um, life stories around conversion and religious, multiple religious belonging. Um, and, you know, that relationship, which developed kind of serendipitously through a graduate student of Dr. Ponaya's who was involved in that conference, um, now I think our aim would be to develop a joint publication um, thinking about that family. Um, and, you know, as her daughters have gotten married and in 2018, I was able to be back in Chennai for her daughter's marriage. Um, you see this really interesting layer of multiple religious belonging of Christianity and Hinduism um, taking shape in a really particular cultural context and cultural moment, I think. Um, and we have different training and different perspectives that we would bring to this project, Dr. Panaya and I, and that all sort of developed out of this joint conference, but very serendipitously. Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you, very valuable uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, suggestions you offered. Uh, another thing that really strikes me, uh, you know, which is quite uh, uh, you know, unforeseen is the uh, once again, the kind of uh, relationship that uh, we began the conference, you know, some of it became very enduring. And um, to give one example, you know, we had a conference on, uh, you know, uh, the idea of home in India and South Asia, and uh, you know, such contacts, uh, you know, uh, you know, which uh, were brought about through this conference were very, very, uh, uh, I mean, that sense, really productive. Uh, to give one example, uh, you know, I had to visit Sri Lanka for a, a project, 
all of a sudden i found myself lost in a place because i couldn't go there you know in i mean colombo i know i was i had the place uh, i was a bit stuck you know i be- in a way i became homeless you know in colombo then i immediately realized that there was a scholar from uh, colombo who had come for the conference so i went through my phone and got her email id and the phone number i think i texted her uh, uh, emila ko and she gave me the model number i texted her and i found her home i mean and uh, that evening was a very very pleasant evening it was a great surprise you know uh, and became a very uh, you know uh, engaging relationship afterwards you know then she was to chennai again uh, so similarly there are two other scholars uh, who uh, one from canada who came for this particular conference that we convened and he came back again for another conference in madras university uh, similarly there was a scholar from midori from japan uh, she again came back to the uh, you know uh, to the university of madras for a next conference i held Uh, another interesting thing is a person who, with whom uh, you know i had last uh, lost contact uh, dr diksha uh, uh, about two months ago i got an email from her can you participate on a, a web uh, fgd focus group discussion on a particular topic about uh, culture religion covid and all that in india uh, so it was something about i mean eight years later you know we connected and it was a very very engaging conversation about uh, how covid affected uh, you know people's lives and uh, uh you know how poverty was uh, you know uh, was the you know fallout of the covid and how uh, people were able to negotiate their lives in the midst of poverty and how, how much government uh, or agency i mean uh, government other agencies came to their help so this was very very interesting kind of a uh, you know surprising conversation that we had which was never anticipated before but just came on the way precisely because of this uh, ensuring contacts this uh, you know this uh, particular conference gave us I love that both of you kind of share this idea of the you know just as a question on out, unexpected outcomes it could have been any any number of things that come out of it um you know new grant applications or your specific scholarly volumes and and kind of frame the outcomes in that way but both of you actually talked about relationships that came from this collaboration um and these long lasting things either years later connecting with people or connecting people in with a uh, connecting with people in unexpected places and <laughs> circumstances um and that's really it says something about the nature of how you both view the collaboration here that's at the heart of this so that's really interesting that you both framed it that way um kind of moving back from the one on one relationships moving to institutions um amy you mentioned that there was a specific um institution university that you were also trying to bring into the fold and and this is maybe more like a logistical <laughs> like to your question but um you know have you tried to bring in other institutions formally into the collaboration you know via gosh the grants and paperwork in that avenue um you know if so how has that gone are there any um plans to to formalize bringing in additional institutions into the mix yeah so i can say a couple of things about that so um I guess it was in 2020 James we were supposed to host for the first time the conference for the study of religions of India at the University of Madras so it was the 50th anniversary of that conference um and that organization um it had long been a hope to host the conference in India at some point and in 2020 that was planned um and so James was integrally involved in that as you might imagine um along with the executive committee of that conference um and that was canceled due to the pandemic um but that you know conference leadership team involves people from Elon University um you know University of California Davis um Butler University um you know St Michael's College in Toronto right so a, a broad number of um North America based uh institutions would have been collaborating then formally with the University of Madras and unfortunately that was canceled and we'll see if we can resurrect plans to do that in a future year um so that was one set of collaborations that we imagined involving other institutions the grant application that was not successful that i expect at some point will dust off or reincarnate in some new way um was actually somewhat public health focused 
it was a community-based participatory research approach to health needs of the Irla community um, in the southern um, you know, districts just outside of Chennai. And that involved Stella Mary's um, and Christ College, um, which is down in Kilicherry, and the University of Madras and Elon. So we're always seeking to include other Indian institutions um, in our work. And Dr. Panaya is very well connected and has colleagues in a number of places with whom he collaborates regularly. Um, and I could imagine that Bishop Cotton College in Bangalore would be another um, collaborator for us in the future. We have a whole host of nascent plans for what we'll do together next year um, when I hope to be back in Chennai. But another institution that I'll just mention, and Dr. Panaya can follow up on any of these, is the Asian Center for Cross-Cultural Studies, um, which is also south of Chennai. Um, and due to invitations to speak there and to present on inside or outsider dynamics and fieldwork methodologies um, in a methodology seminar, the head of that um, institution, um, Dr. Felix, has now invited me to be on the editorial board of a journal that he founded. So, um, you know, the, con the collaborations continue to multiply and sort of exponentialize. Um, so from, you know, a sort of one-to-one you know, a relationship, it's it's grown into this broader network. And I think that we only see ourselves continuing to grow that and continuing to pull in students, um, both students from Indian institutions and Elon University. Yeah, see, well, one more thing I just want to add here is you know, see the collaborations, uh, you know, uh, can be um, a starting point for a MOU, you know, for formal uh, uh, formal, uh, you know, official relationship between um, institutions, you know. Uh, that's what we did in the, uh, you know, uh, with the Ilan University. First, we held the conference. Uh, then, the, so we had concrete, uh, you know, activities going on, academic activities going on, even before the collaboration, you know, official collaboration, you know, or MOUs, okay, or institutional uh, collaboration, you know. Uh, uh, so, in fact, Madras University is very cautious to strike, uh, you know, MOUs with other institutes, uh, only when they are sure that this MOU will yield concrete results, they will go into uh, MOUs. Um, so, so before something becomes official, uh, we want to do something informal, you know. So the concrete uh, collaborative activities become first steps towards more formal collaborations later, you know. So this is how we have started off with one institution as uh, we have more activities coming up as more concrete projects uh, you know, are on the way. We will enter into collaborations, official uh, kind of a collaboration with other institutions in the days to come. If I could just add one other thing, Anandi, I think um, all PhDs have to go through the University of Madras as a deemed institution. And so now by virtue of this collaboration, um, both myself and Dr. Pennington are often called on to review dissertations um, as an outside reader and to advise graduate students. Um, and this is something that we have been doing for the last several years. Uh, and it's it's important work. Um, it contributes to the scholarly and academic development of graduate students who become our colleagues. Um, and it's also really enjoyable and enriching work that keeps us in touch with cutting edge material that's being worked on um, at the Indian end. And so that has been another fruit of this collaboration. You know, it's interesting mentioning kind of what the institution outlines is, you know, to make sure that these uh, collaborations are um, going to be fruitful, maybe in that sense, or, or just the position of the university. And then, you know, that is then creating these specific relationships between you and Dr. Pennington, for example, Amy, um, there are, you know, specific relationship with those students and how the institutions, of course, perpetually forming our daily lives, um, how those specifically define the nature of co the collaboration in a way, working within the institutions as well as beyond them in a way. Of course, there is kind of the uh, the elephant in the room of the last few years, uh, other things that are shaping the way the collaborations work. And of course, that's been the pandemic. And, you know, I'm curious about you know, what has that done to the nature of the collaborative efforts? Uh, 
Yeah, so, Dr. Mielako had uh, yeah already mentioned how the pandemic really uh, you know <laughs> uh, played a havoc in our you know important very very important very very important you know dream of our collaboration which is uh, the CSRI in India you know celebrating 50 years uh, definitely it was a huge hit to our collaboration. Uh, so the last two years, our collaboration has been uh, kind of uh, mostly planning something for the future and interacting uh, through uh, Google Meet, Google Conversations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, therefore, uh, definitely it has adversely affected. I think uh, the collaboration uh, uh, had not been, uh, you know, was there not, uh, you know, um, a pandemic, things would have gone, uh, you know, um, much further in our collaboration. So we have. Uh, in fact, experience of setback, I should uh, uh, acknowledge openly. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us took global mobility um, for granted. And when it was um, suspended, we felt the constraint of that. Um, you know, I haven't been to India now in just over three years, which is the longest that I have been outside of India since 1995 when I went first. Um, so we're going in January with our study abroad students and, you know, James will lecture to those students and we'll all go to the University of Madras. But more than that, um, it will be the first time that we will be physically in the same place and we can start hatching plans in person instead of on WhatsApp video calls um, on Sunday mornings. And, um, you know, I think some of the things that we envision that were on hold, we have a great deal of excitement about revivifying those plans and bringing them to um, the fore in this next academic year when I'm hoping to be in India for um, a new project. So yeah, the pandemic has um, caused some of our graduate students, um, you know, a lot of difficulty in carrying out their field work and they have had fewer visiting lecturers um, and flows of different ideas into their intellectual spaces. And I think that, you know, we're looking forward now with excitement to um, reanimating some of those relationships um, and bringing people back together, not just virtually, but also physically, um, so that intellectual exchange can really come back to being um, a, a primary priority. It's interesting, you know, without being able to travel and bring people together physically, that's like this kind of lacking of, and I'm, you know, playing with kind of the pun of the home here, you know, playing with that idea uh, of what is kind of the collaborative home. You know, if they, if people can't come together, you know, in a physical capacity, it seems like there's something lacking there that there's, you know, some plans can be made, but it's lacking some depth or there's just a sense of, critical mass almost in coming together to, I don't know, to, to create those unexpected outcomes, maybe to, to further the scholarship, further the discussion, because there's only so much that can happen in this kind of virtual, um, like home-ish space, I guess, that we have here, you assume. Um, and, you know, just as an aside, as we're thinking towards the future, um, and these ideas of collaborative homes. I'd like to make a, this, this brief aside before we, we wrap up and think about the future. Um, in terms of collaboration and playing with this idea of home, which you know, is the nature of the conference and, and Dr. Panaya's book and, um, and what you all are working with, I, I just, I'd love for you to kind of um, maybe riff for a moment on the idea of home and collaboration. And just as these concepts that were kind of swirling around in this conversation with, with relation to your work. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes say that I grew up in the field because I went to India first when I was a junior in college um, for a semester of study abroad in what was then Madras. And I have continued to return to the same place. Um, and AWS has made so much of that possible um, from a year of Tamil language training in Madurai in the early 2000s to a junior dissertation fellowship to write about snake goddesses and Nagadosham um, onward to my my current project about domesticating the dead. And then in the future, I'm sure there will be other um, manifestations of this. So I am 
at home in some respects in India. Um, and I miss that other home when I am in this home. Um, and so one uh, reflection on that was um, a co-edited journal issue in Fieldwork and Religion that I did with Jennifer Ortegren, um just a couple of years ago where we talked about homes, uh, home and away and home and field and the porosity and blended nature of those um, those places um, and the introduction to that was written during the pandemic when we were all longing for our other homes um, in our field sites and field contexts, et cetera, right? So there is this sense of shared homes, um, but I would say our collaboration in particular doesn't really have a home base um, because we enjoy having James Panaya come to the United States as much as we enjoy being in India. And often when James is in the United States, he stays in my home. Um, and that's where we hatch breakfast plans and, you know, all kinds of, you know, other gardening plans and, you know, share our lives, which are not just about scholarly collaboration, but are about a lot of other things, including families. Um, and so I have often been welcomed into family events in James's family. When I've been in Chennai, um, his nieces are some of my most committed Instagram followers. Um, and there are, you know, homes that develop on multiple platforms and in multiple places and spaces. So now as I gear up to go to the American Academy of Religion conference in Denver in a couple of weeks, I am um, sad that James will not be joining us in person um, this year because the AAR is another place where we get to um, talk about ideas, talk about other people's papers, talk about what we're working on um, and talk about what we want to do in the future. So home is a shifting concept. I think the pandemic has brought that idea into high relief. Our collaboration has a number of different homes um, and I think probably we'll find new ways to in place or um in home those collaborations as we move um through the the coming years yeah yeah see one of the one of the uh, you know one of the purposes of this particular conference that we held on uh, homemaking you know is to reflect on uh, the changing nature of homes you know i mean it was a very uh, monolithic, uh, you know, uniform kind of uh, traditional homes, you know, that was the nature of homes earlier. But today we are in a changing context, therefore the multiplicity, uh, you know, uh, heterogeneity, uh, shared experiences of cultures, religions, ideas, you know, uh, spaces, uh, which all of this I thought has been experience of collaboration, right? Uh, you know, the plurality, multiplicity, as I, I mean, I love to write even when I go there to the US, uh, we make uh, idlis in a US home. Uh, you know, I, I get pastas, I'm carrying pastas in a home. So there are so much of, uh, you know, plurality and, you know, pluralism and, uh, you know, I mean, I can go on and on, you know. So a lot of uh, such ideas of, uh, you know, uh, being open to, uh, you know, multiplicity of experiences in terms of food, in terms of conversations, in terms of academic ideas, uh, I think that way, I think this uh, collaboration is actually a home to uh, the experience of, uh, you know, of, uh, heterogeneity and multiplicity. And now looking toward the future of all of this in, in, in placing and in homing uh, collaboration, you mentioned several areas which you all are, are, are moving towards. Um, and there's lots of planning um, that's probably, that we've talked about, but probably lots of planning throughout the pandemic of, of next steps and ideas. What is the one that you're most excited about? Like I said, you've already mentioned a few things in, in work. Um, so I'm kind of curious what the what is the one where uh, you're quite excited about where it's going or or something imminent that, that you all are both working on. So perhaps the most um, imminent is the study abroad course that we will bring to India in January. Um, and AWS is helping us with some of the pieces there. Um, and certainly James is looking forward to meeting students um, and he will give a formal lecture to them at the University of Madras. But of course, on the very first night or the second night of our course, he always meets us and we just walk the students when we're trying to keep them awake um, and help them settle in in terms of time zone. 
we usually walk around to some of the really important churches um, in Mylapore, which is walkable from where we stay. Um, Luz Church, you know, celebrated its, you know, 500th anniversary not so long ago. And th these are places that that we like to walk our students around in the evening. And James contributes so much um, historically and in terms of the contemporary life of these Catholic sites and neighborhoods. Um, so that's maybe the most imminent one. Um, but we have a scholarly project in the conception stage for next year, looking at a um, neighborhood which has recently been incorporated into Chennai that is not yet um, fully outfitted with infrastructure, but people are living there. Um, and we're really interested in tracing um, religious sites and religious identities in this sort of um developing neighborhood over time. So this would be a first foray into mapping the temples and churches and um, you know all of the religious sites of this neighborhood as it's developing and as families are moving in, there's a lot of construction, roads are not totally finished, um, but that is um, one project that we've been discussing recently. And it's one that we could do in pieces over time and keep coming back to. And we were wondering if we might have a multimedia element to that project where students could access um, that over time in a web format. Um, so a sort of digital humanities project that we could use in our teaching. And that might be something that students, maybe study abroad students in collaboration with the University of Madras students could continue to map and contribute to over time, um, over the course of years and sort of build layers onto that project. So that's something that we're talking about doing for next year. Uh, certainly, I think uh, uh, you know uh, what Amy Alako mentioned is true, and also you know another thing that we she mentioned earlier uh, to make in-depth study of this particular you know uh, uh, slum uh, you know Christian family, uh, uh, which is undergoing some kind of a change. You know, so it's a very personal. Uh, it could be an interesting case study to see how uh, how religious identities you know in a slum context you know is very porous. You know, it's not uh, really you know. Uh, fixed with boundaries and so on and so forth. So we want to really uh, uh, delve deep into this and uh, try to understand uh, you know, how this uh, develops over a period of time and uh, what are the what are the uh, promises and uh, what are the challenges that this particular family offers for uh, for urban uh, you know, uh, slum you know, uh, families in India. Well, thank you both so much. Um, as we say at the end of our podcast, I believe that's our time for today. Um, and before we wrap up, um, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Porni Maleta uh, to, to close us out for the day. Porni, you're muted. <laughs> the dreaded mute button gets the best of all of us. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Ponaya and Professor Aloko for taking the time to be a part of this special webinar series as we mark 60 valuable years of supporting American scholarship on India. Through this webinar series, we at the AIIS want to express our deepest gratitude to our affiliating institutions in India and to our fellows over the last six decades for always helping us showcase the AIIS research fellowship programs and the spirit of cooperation, collaboration and mutual understanding between the citizens of the United States of America and India. As always, a very special thanks to our president, Professor Sumati Ramaswamy, for envisioning the 60th year commemorative series, to Elise Auerbach for always being there for our fellows, to Anandi for making all our web events so very special, and last but not the least, to Richa Upuluri uh, for adding value to this series. Thank you so very much. And now, um, in case anybody has any questions or just wants to chat in general about this, like I'd love to open it up here. Of course, uh, Sumati, please take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. That was such a rich and interesting discussion. And, you know, Anandi mentioned the elephant in the room as being the pandemic. And I was thinking the elephant in the room to me, I think, is the question of religion. Right. Um, you know, we are living in a world in which religious identities and religious affiliation are proving to be so divisive 
and contested and fraught. And yet, you know, you are talking, you as both of you as scholars of religion um, are talking about how it is working on religion that has brought you together in, you know, in collaboration and in friendship and so on. And I wondered whether you wanted to talk about that. Is it more difficult or e uh, that's not the way to put it, I think. That's simplistic, I think. You know, and I find that actually um, uh, our students, you know, you know, by the time you're, you know, for professors, we become so, you know, sort of um, skeptical about ideas of religious affect at some level. But our students are really um, driven, in a sense, right, by a lot of religious questions and religious um, yearning. So I wonder whether you want to talk about religion itself. I'm very curious um, as enabling a collaborative activity or being a problem in some regards, if you have seen that also as a problem. Uh, I, for one, would think, uh, you know, uh, definitely today, uh, you know, religion has become a very problematic term, uh, precisely because, as you rightly mentioned uh, today, uh, uh, religion is appropriated by, you know, uh, various stakeholders in society for various purposes. Uh, uh, but I think uh, the role of a scholar here is to uh, uh, drive uh, the uh, thinking community, you know, the students as well as the, you know, um, the non-scholarly, uh, you know, academicians on religion, you know, 